that starts right Good morning, this is the 36th District Democrats. We are delighted to be interviewing Liza Rankin this morning for school board director position one. Over to you, Liza, to introduce yourself. Hi, good morning, thank you. Um, my name is Liza Rankin. I am running for Seattle School Board position one, which is uh, the seat I currently occupy. Um, and in that role, I'm also the current board vice president and legislative liaison. I'm the mom of two Seattle Public School students st who started middle school and high school this year. And I'm a former Seattle Public School student. I ran for this role in 2019 to support the district strategic plan that focused on educational equity and excellence. And I'm running again because we're at such a critical time, both for Seattle Public Schools and public education in honestly in our country. Um, with the political climate and challenges coming at public education, our students and our educators and our families. Um, we in Seattle Public Schools are facing the, uh, a period of recovery, a period of really uh, critical time to dig in deep, get behind our values and make really, really wise, prudent decisions for the school district, both in terms of economics and our budget and in terms of what's best for our kids, what we know is best for our kids and not yield on um, standing up for the rights of our students, their access to public education and taking their place in our communities. Um, throughout my first term, I have successfully advocated for uh, one of the, uh, the largest increase at the state level for special education funding and I plan to continue that adv advocacy. I've built relationships across the state with other school boards, uh, school board directors, and with legislators to build the trust that has been missing from the Seattle Public Schools with the state legislature and in support of not only our needs, but the needs of all students across the state. Um, I'm a known and trusted advocate and community member across all of Seattle and really just want to continue that work and make sure that um, that Seattle Public Schools is the first choice for all Seattle families. Thank you, Liza. Our first question this morning will be asked by Toby. Yes, and you get an opportunity to continue filling out your intro. Why are you running for school board? Well, I'm running to because I'm of the things I mentioned in my intro and also because of some things happening in our in our governance and at the state legislature that we're sort of in the middle of, it feels like we're at a tipping point where we could continue to make progress to bring the change that so many families and educators have been asking for for such a long time, or we could give up and keep going with this sort of chaotic emergency-based governance and, and, and district management that we have all become unfortunately very used to. Um, I'm leading a complete policy manual review right now for the board as the chair of a policy review committee to ensure that our policies are all really meaningful and effective and have actual, uh, and that we use them for actual measures of accountability against the district. Our policies are meant to be the representative voice of what the community's vision and values are around education. And we, you know, every time I open the manual, there's something that hasn't been looked at since 2011. And if the board is not continually looking at and reviewing and updating those policies, that means that there's nobody holding that to the whole district and saying, this is what we as a community as ex expect for our students in education and tell us how you're doing on that. Tell us how you're living up to this policy. That's something that's really been missing and um, it's exciting. It's boring probably to a lot of people, but to me it's really exciting because it really is the board taking the power that the board should have in being very, very clear and giving direction to the superintendent um, as they run the organization um, by federal and state laws for public education. And so it's an exciting time that I wanna just, I really wanna make sure that that continues and is embedded for the better future of Seattle Public Schools. Thank you so much, Liza. Our next question will be asked by Barbara. Hi, Liza. So it's in the chat if you wanna read along with me. Oh, great, thank you. Um, so enrollment in the Seattle public schools has declined since 2020. What steps would you take to reverse this decline? 
That's a question that's come up a lot. It's, it, of course, doesn't have a straightforward answer. Um, the decline has a lot of different uh, factors to it and goes back even to like more like 2018, sort of a slower decline. And then the, the pandemic really accelerated it. And by all counts, we should be starting to see an upswing again, but it's gonna take some time. So I wanna make sure that we're working with the city on um, aligning capacity in our schools to planned increased capacity in housing. Part of the enrollment decline is there are fewer kids in Seattle than there used to be overall. I know it's sort of popular and easy to say, oh, kids are fleeing Seattle public schools and going to private schools. But I've been looking into um, data collected by the State Board of Education and it doesn't show that that's the case. Seattle pub public schools has enrollment has declined by about 7% over the last five years and private school enrollment has also declined by about 4%. So this kind of one-to-one -one exodus is, is not playing out. There's a whole bunch of different factors. Housing affordability and lack of density has a huge piece to do with it. We can't directly impact that as a school board, but we can certainly work with the city to help them understand that when we talk about density, we need to talk about affordable family housing, not just studios and one bedroom apartments. Um, we also need to uh, make sure that in our, our capital projects, that we're thinking about um, great buildings that people want to send their kids to. Um, I just had the opportunity to be at the opening, the ribbon cutting of James Baldwin Elementary, and it is such a beautiful, inspiring, bright, welcoming facility. And not every kid has access to that right now. And so we need to make sure that we're, we're aligning that with where students live now and where we think they're going to live to make sure that we're um, providing the best education and opportunity for students, which will make more people want to come back if they've maybe made other choices. Um, and it also is just a really good investment of our funds. Thank you, Liza. Our third question will be asked by Jeremy. Um, once again, this question is in the chat as well. Um, how will you uphold the rights, dignity, safety, and inclusion of all students, and what will, and what would be your specific focus to do so? Um, so thank you for that question. That is something that has been really key to why I came to the board in the first place, is recognizing not only the that that students have differences, but that all kinds of diversity is important, needs recognition, value, and to be celebrated, and not only recognized, but included, and so that students belong, so that every student is a fully included member of their community. Um, I actually was just on a call with some um, school board directors from across the state, and we're discussing a position about diversity that um, the, uh, the state board of directors, uh, or excuse me, WASDA, the Washington State Director Association is considering that we thought um, didn't didn't highlight enough the importance of recognizing and protecting and including students for their differences and belonging. Um, if you look at my my past uh, three and a half, three and a three quarter years on the board, um, I have been a leading voice for making sure that disability, that race, are included in our policies. That we're not when we say all students, we actually mean every student, um, and really ensuring that we are focusing very specifically on the way we make our investments and the way that we provide resources and address student need is in response to different identities and different needs. Um, I'm really concerned specifically right now about the kind of national climate around um, transgender and um, gender expansive students. And we have Luckily in Washington state, people actually move here for the protections that we have. We have some really good protections at the state level and we have passed, um, it, during my term, have passed an approved policy, further policy to further more directly um, address the safety needs of those students and affirm that they belong and need to have their needs met as any other student. And I will just continue to do the work I've already been doing. Thank you, Liza. Our Oh, we're already on the fourth prepared question. We'll be asked by Shet. This will be the final question before we go to follow-ups. What are your thoughts on addressing the budget deficit? And if necessary, how would you approach deciding which schools to close? So this definitely connects to um, some of my earlier questions. Uh, so we've already approved um, you know, this year's budget and we're looking at next year's budget that we have to, you know, the, the legislature 
gives themselves a, a budget approval every two years, but they make school districts do it every one year. And so we are, um, I've actually written direction to the superintendent in the form of a resolution to change our practice to add a step in our budget process that would require the superintendent to provide the, the board and therefore the public with a, a specific plan if there is a projected deficit or even a projected, um, uh, it's probably not gonna happen, but if, if a significant amount of, of, of revenue comes to the district that is significantly larger than anticipated, it directs the superintendent to come with us to say what their recommendation is um, to address that gap. And so I think we really need to look at kind of like I was talking about with buildings, maximizing the resources that we do have and continue to advocate. Like I said in my intro, I've been um, part of statewide advocacy uh, for about a decade on um, per increasing progressive revenue at the state level. We know that without progressive revenue, there's never going to be generated the dollars that are needed for districts across the state. Um, so progressive revenue and also increasing funding specifically for education, which is the paramount duty of the state. Um, so I'm going to continue building partnerships and working with legislators and other board directors. And this is another opportunity to really ensure that what we're funding in Seattle is supporting our highest priorities. The budget should be a reflection of our values. And so as we're looking at our budget, that's the lens that I take through it is are, is the way that we're spending money leading to the outcomes that we all want and expect for our children and things that aren't doing that, we need to, we need to reallocate. Thank you. Lex. I didn't get to the building question. Sorry. <laughs> Part of that. <laughs> we will, um, we will now do follow up questions. I will see if there are hands from Jeremy. Um, yeah. Um, so so um, my daughter just started third grade. Her class is 32 students. That seems like an awful lot for, especially mm -hmm. for a third grader. Um, could you talk a little bit about how class sizes like that, like why they are happening and, you know, if, if that is acceptable? I can, I don't know if I can do it in a minute, but I will try really hard because I actually know the answer. <laughs> to all of it is more than a minute. So we are funded by the state on a per pupil basis, which means that we only get money for the students that we have. And so the district makes projections the best they can in, in they update them in February and June to make the best possible guess for how many students they're gonna have in the fall. And they staff according to that number of students uh, for class sizes that are within, um, within what's in the, uh, the agreement with the SEA. The state then does, so, th so they do that, they make a best guess. They can make some tweaks, but they make a best guess because if we guess too far in the too many students and then those students don't show up and we staffed for that larger number of students, we will still be on the hook. We keep those people employed um, and then we'll increase our budget deficit by paying for staff without the students who bring the revenue. So there's always an adjustment period and the state counts it not until October. So I would anticipate that your principal is on it because that is over the caseload, but it takes, because of the way the state funding formula works, um, it can't happen right away. And I could talk more about it by the time around. Thank you, Liza. Toby? Uh, hopefully someone else will ask you to finish answering that because I have a different question. Uh, and that, that you, you mentioned the housing issue mm -hmm. and the lack of uh, family-sized housing being built. The city of Seattle, the city council next year is doing its comprehensive plan under the Growth yes. Management Act. It, will you work to have the school district inject the school district's demographic information and policy suggestions? Yes, I will. And actually very specifically, um, it's my understanding that there used to be a standing committee of some kind between the board and the city. We do have board directors who sit on like the levy oversight committee, for example, uh, for the city levy and, and some other things like that. But we don't have that um, between the board and the city. 
that uh, sort of planning relationship. And I know it used to exist. And so that's actually something I'm really committed to doing is ensuring that we have both staff and board representation working with the city as they develop that plan to make sure that they have our needs and um, and also what we can do for students um, embedded in that so that we don't end up with, you know, an empty school and a whole bunch of portables, for example, that we can really work together and make sure that um, that our schools are being considered as an integral part of their um, their plan. Thank you, Liza. I'm going to call back on Jeremy now, and I think we didn't have our blue sky going. Oh, now he's Okay, back over to you, Jeremy. Oh, that seemed like about a minute. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, could you just finish up the answer about the class sizes question, specifically the like, you know, the impacts of? What yeah, that so it's it's like I said, it's a tricky balance because, like, ideally and a sort of emotionally and even logically, we want to say, well, we'll just we'll just err on the side of like, what's the harm if a class is smaller than we expected it to be? The harm is if that happens at 50 different schools, that could be 50 additional staffing positions that we're trying to fund that we don't have the revenue to fund because those students aren't there, if that makes sense. So the first, um, when you think there's a couple different ways we can address it. I'm actually, I'm actually going to be in an elementary school on Monday for this very reason, um, and probably throughout the week when kindergartners start because there's a special education classroom that is feeling particularly overwhelmed and reached out to me for some support because they they're not sure how, how long they can wait to meet the needs of those students. So it's definitely an issue in our staffing model also that I want to address, but the biggest constraint is that student funding ratio and trying to make a best guess. Mm, thank you, Liza. I even could go in another minute or two to keep talking about it. But. Um, I will jump in to ask you to, to finish your thought on this and we'll give you another follow-up. Sure. Yeah, I think there's there's some thing, you know, we need some some advocacy at the state level to really encourage the legislature to understand the impact that these formulas and restrictions have on our kids. Like it's not it's not um, intangible. It's a real thing when, oh, my gosh, there's 32 students. There's only supposed to be 26 or 28. Um, how can we shuffle around? There's also sometimes when um, you know students don't come in perfect grade level packages of those numbers. So you could have a school where um, the overall class to you know student to teacher ratio is acceptable, but then because there's more fourth graders, um, it, it ends up the numbers end up being a little bit funny. And so it's it's I also think we can address it at the district level level with our staffing model. We have a staffing model that doesn't allow for a lot of flexibility. It's called the waiting, weighted staffing standard. And I would like to really change that um, to make it more values-based so that we're funding what our kids need and building staffing around that instead of it just being about the number of students. Thank you, Liza. Is there another follow up? We're coming to the end of our time together. Maybe time for one more. Yeah. I would, I will jump in to ask a question then. Of, I'd love to hear some more of your thoughts around the kind of accountability and oversight role that the school board can play or should play um, mm -hmm. and what you've learned around that and what you see for your, should you be elected again for your next term? Yeah, what I mean, what I've really learned is that a lot of people don't understand what the school board does. <laughs> Even people who are on school boards, um, um, there's a lot of confusion about that. And I think the, uh, the, the, and this isn't unique to Seattle, it has sort of the roles of the superintendent and the school board have sort of flipped where people expect the superintendent to have the vision and then people run for school board because there's some issue or handful of issues that they want to get in and fix. And that's actually the opposite. The school board represents, is there to represent the voice of the community and direct the superintendent as the superintendent is leading operations and implementations in accordance with state and federal law. Nobody needs to come in and redefine what it means to provide education. What we need to make sure is that the superintendent is providing 
um, is creating the conditions and providing the education that meets state and federal law and that's in alignment with the values that the, that the school board holds. And to do that, we have to have this continual cycle of evaluation and conversation in public that happens in funky ways. And I'm excited about where we're headed to make that happen in a more effective way and in public. Thank you, Liza. Our formal part of our interview has now concluded. Jeremy will recap what happened.